I'm going to ask you a question this morning. And when I do, I, I, I ask that you seriously ponder my question to you, okay? Consider it. But before you answer, I don't want you to answer this out loud. I don't want to hear a single voice. When I ask this question, I want you to internalize your answer. No matter what your answer is, I just have another request. Once you have this inside your head, again, keeping it to yourselves this morning, I would like to put your answer on a proverbial shelf for the next 30, 35 minutes. Once I'm done teaching the Word of God this morning, you can take your answer back off the shelf. And if your answer was as strong before the sermon, Put it back in your heart. But you discover that your initial answer is changed, enhanced, improved, modified, any verb you want to use to signify improvement, then praise the Lord. Because if you were a proclaimed Christian this morning, your answer is more important than you might initially think. Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Here's the question. Is he your king? Is he truly your Lord? Pray with me this morning, please. We come humbly before your throne of grace this morning. Lord, we ask of you to please help us understand truly who you are today. Please help us to understand your word, your gospel. Please help us understand that it's not about what we think. It's a matter about who you are. And may our impression of you, our understanding of you, line up 100% with what your word says. Open our ears to hear your word. Write your words upon our hearts. Strengthen us as we go out into the world. And it's in your precious name that we bring this before you. And if, as I teach this morning, I pray, Lord God, that it is by your spirit and to your children only and solely that I may not be in the way of your message this morning. It's in your precious name we ask these things, Jesus. Amen. Please stand this morning for the reading of God's Word today. Mark 1, 21 through 28. And they went into Cap Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for, they taught, for he taught them as one who had had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately... There was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice came out of him. And they were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? a new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once, his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. You may be seated. Praise God for the reading of his word this morning. Immediately after Jesus called the first of his disciples, we encountered this moment in Capernaum where he goes into the synagogue during a Saturday Sabbath and teaches the oracles. The oracles of God are what we know now as the Old Testament. The law and the prophets were given to the Israelites. And those who were gathered were amazed at how he taught. Because verse 22 actually tells us that he taught with authority. And that brings us to the first of five points that I would like to address today. Number one, he establishes authority. 
He establishes his authority. If someone who has a purpose with something approaches any one of us, they will, and they must enact some sort of a motive for, for what, they're, what they're claiming. If they stand in authority, they have to enact what they're stating. Because we live in a culture that does not only not accept or believe in Christ Jesus, but they don't understand, those of us who do know him, don't really understand his authority. You know, we, we throw out easily our complaints to God. We should stand, my, my brothers and sisters, in awe of God. And remember that it is an absolute, I, I, we don't even deserve to be heard from him. And yet he gives us his ear. Our supplications are heard through Jesus Christ, who represents us, who intervenes to the Father for us. But if we, you know, if you go to a job, someone says they're the boss. It's easier to respect and appreciate them if they know what they're talking about. If they lead well, right? They all have had horrible bosses before. Some of us have made horrible bosses before. <laughs> but if somebody's presenting themselves an authority, we look at how they interact. That's a, that's a, common, that's a common point. What Jesus does here, though, is he doesn't just read from the text, showing them that he knows what he's talking about with authority, because his reading of the text showed everyone there that he had the authority. He spoke like a woman with authority. But he went a step further here in this presentation in Mark, because there's a man in the synagogue who has this unclean spirit. Big deal, maybe, some people are thinking. No, no one knew this man had an unclean spirit, otherwise he wouldn't have been allowed in the synagogue. He's not just hanging out and ignore Joe over here. He's got an unclean spirit. Nobody knows he has an unclean spirit. He moves with the people in the synagogue. They're all in the synagogue, and a man has an unclean spirit. And in the presence of the one who has authority, Jesus, he cries out, in verse 24, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. We read this now in hindsight, and we sort of gloss over this idea. But this happened in front of an entire synagogue of people. And I mean, let me ask you this. What if you and I were in attendance in the church, right, and in a synagogue? And Jesus begins to read from the oracles. And some guy stands up and starts crying out, screams this out. It would get our attention, to say the least. We would not simply brush this under the rug, sweep it under the rug. So I'm going to reread those last three verses. And the unclean spirit convulsing him crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves, saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread throughout everywhere, throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. Let me remind you here that the people who are making this thing, he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. They're not followers of him. They're simply seeing what is occurring in front of them. They recognize that there's something going on here. When the demon speaks through the man in whom he is possessing, what have you to do with us? This is an idiom that, that distances the speaker from the person who addressed it. This really goes back to 2 Samuel and the sons of Zeruiah when David is speaking to his adversary. You see, to the demons, Jesus is their adversary. To the demons, Jesus is their enemy. But he's still their God. He is God incarnate. He is their God. They bow before him. That's why this 
demon-possessed man, like, you know, and flirts. However that went down, he still says what he says because Jesus speaks with authority. He was the one through whom all things were created through and for, according to Scripture. And this includes the, the, the angels, both the loyal ones and the fallen ones. And they respond to his authority. We read about how the angels ministered to Jesus after he resisted the three temptations of Satan at the end of his 40 days in the wilderness. And they came to minister him. And here we see the polar opposite, one who speaks through the man, an unclean spirit, and he blurts out, what do you want from us? This cannot, be, this cannot be ignored. Let's move to Mark 1, 29 through 34. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever. And immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. And the fever left her. And she began to serve them. That evening at sundown they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door, and he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. That brings us to numero dos. He displays his authority. When we talk about Jesus, who has the authority on this earth to silence demons? No one. No one here other than Jesus has the authority to rebuke a demon. You nor I have the authority over demons. This kind of goes in con complete conflict with what I grew up knowing uh, and when I became a believer in a Pentecostal church where I have the authority to, re to remove them. I don't have the authority. I can, I can challenge and I can speak because of a, I'm a spirit-filled believer. I can speak on behalf of Christ to remove the iniquity of said demons. But it is by his authority that these demons obey him, not me or you. We don't have the authority, but we have the ability to stand firm knowing that we have the spirit of the living God indwelling that we cannot be overtaken, that we cannot be uh, possessed, we cannot be filled with an unclean spirit, but that doesn't stop them from attacking us at any time. But it is by the authority in which we have through Christ that they will not win because the authority lies in Jesus Christ. When I get angry with satan's infiltration i do i'm like i rebuke you in christ jesus name and then i immediately gulf myself in prayer lord god thank you thank you for who you are thank you for everything you are i'm going to withstand this attack because of you your authority your glory so on it is by this that we have the ability to stand as his elect. Because he's displaying his authority through us. We are his representation. But we don't have the authority. Apart from him at all. What did Jesus do about the demons? He silenced them. The only thing they have authority over is this world and the ones that have not been redeemed. And by rebuking demons, Jesus displays his authority. Mark 1, 35 through 39 is our next portion of Scripture. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go out to the, to the next towns that I may preach there also. 
So that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. This presents to us our third point, authority in agreement. Jesus departs and spends time with the Father. Okay, he leaves the mass of the guys, everybody who's following him. This is a big old entourage. He's getting attention. It's like fame. You know, see, uh, your favorite artist pulls up in a tour bus. There's people waiting at the venue ready to welcome them. You don't think that this happens with Jesus. He's been, un, he's been casting out unclean spirits, rebuking demons, healing people. His fame spreads, according to Scripture, what we read in the very beginning. His fame spread. So he has to withdraw. And we see Jesus withdraw. He withdraws from the crowds, and he goes in silent prayer to the Father. And people are like, well, if he's one with the Father, why is he praying to the Father? Because he's one with the Father, and it's his Father. Let me explain. Jesus prays to the Father whom he is one with. And I believe this shows the monotheistic understanding of our triune God. We have served one God, monotheistic, one God. That is what the monotheistic means. But it's a triune God because it's a Father, Son, and a Spirit. All three are completely in agreement. They are never in disagreement. All three are, um, the Son relies on the Father. The Father and the Spirit intervenes. This is where we see the authority in agreement. They are three in agreement, and all three are in authority, but they all are all three one. That, they cannot operate apart from one another. And as hard as it is for our brains to understand a triune God, in principle, in, we can understand the fact. And then we spend the rest of our lives attempting to, to learn more about him and this triunity um, because we should never be fully mentally satisfied with our faith. If you are mentally satisfied with your faith today, I'm going to urge you to not get comfortable. You should be always seeking through more understanding and learning. If our God is in complete authority, then he, he will never reveal everything to you and I, ever. No matter how hard and how much we study, we're never going to get everything about God and his characteristics completely understood, even as much as we seek. No matter how much knowledge and wisdom we individually pride ourselves on possessing, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit will never ever reveal everything to you and I. And we shouldn't desire that. However, we should desire to become better followers of Christ by praying for knowledge and wisdom and more understanding, along with peace and empathy and comprehension and compassion. We should be ever wanting to change who we are to emulate Christ Jesus here on this earth in our lifetime. And, and, and I love to read about him, even if I don't fully, I, I think the more I try to learn too, like I'll get something down really, really good, and then I won't think about it for three years, and then somebody brings it up, and I'm like, oh yeah, what did I learn about that? Because <laughs> there's so much in theology, that's the beautiful part, but if something intrigues you, chase after it. And ask God to give you the wisdom and the knowledge to understand Him better. That's, that's the beauty of this. Don't be satisfied in just your salvation. Learn about Him. It, it, it grows you as, your, as a person in Christ. You know, Jesus tells us in Matthew 6.33, But seek the, first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. What things? The righteous things. So seek Him, and He'll give these to you. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. If you have the indwelling Holy Spirit, your desire and craving to learn more about your God should be right at the forefront. And, and, and the world doesn't get this. They don't want to know it. That's what makes us different from them. However... We evangelize, praying that they will come out of their unbelief. Amen? Spiritually discerned is what 1 Corinthians 2.14 had said. And this is the work of the Spirit of God. The, the follower of Christ is given the ability to understand, but you have to put in the effort. You have to put in the effort. Now, watch what happens next as we conclude Mark 1, 40-45. And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand, 
and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent to him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places. And people were coming to him from every quarter. The leper says, if you will. The response from the Lord is, I will. The leper says in hope, you can make me clean. And Jesus replies, be clean. The Lord asks him not to tell anyone. The man tells everyone. The Lord wants it to not be revealed yet, but the man doesn't comply because he's rejoicing and he wants the Lord's work to be known. And the Lord knew that the man would do this. That's the sovereignty of God. Isn't it ironic that today, Brothers and sisters, we know that we must share the good news of the gospel, yet for so many believers today, we treat the truth as if it were, we were the ones instructed to not tell anyone about our cleansed leprosy like a metaphor for our salvation. Tell them. Tell them. Tell them. This brings us to num- point number four. Revered. To revere means to have deep respect and admiration for. And this is how we should approach the Lord God. You might ask, how do I approach the Lord? What does this look like? The answer is reverently and in worship. Okay? Now listen this morning. The great theologian Francis Schaeffer, once amazing theologian, once stated this question, how, then, how should we then live? We had to go through that entire thing in CLI. You'll get there, William. You remember it, Gage. But it's actually phenomenal. The first guy that wore the best soul patch. I didn't even know who he was back in the 70s. And I, I started learning about him about five years ago. There were more. And I'm like, what a good-looking fella. Anyway, his book how should we then live, answer the questions raised by the radical shift in our culture from modernism to postmodernism. That's what he was addressing. The question that we face in 2023 is closely related to it. How then should we worship? The how of worship is so much disputed today, it's, it's not even funny. The issue has been described as a war of worship today. We have this Exceedingly growing perspective of thinking that it's traditional versus contemporary. But what it is, 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 is understanding that, that there's something greater here. So I want to go through a few points before we bring this to an understanding. The best place for us to answer the how of how to worship is to begin with the who question. Who is it that we are called upon to worship with our whole hearts, minds, soul, and strength? The answer at first glance is exceedingly easy easy here. It is Jesus Christ. But from a Christian perspective, the obvious reply of worshiping the Lord isn't as easy for everybody to understand here. We realize that we are fallen creatures and it is our most basic and fundamental inclination to worship something or someone. And even as believers, sometimes our our pull and our flesh is to worship something or other than the true God that created us. Idolatry is the most grievous of sins. Otherwise, the first four commandments of the Ten Commandments wouldn't be so focused on it. Quit focusing on things other than your God is what the first four commandments state. 
It's imperative that as a believer, a follower of Christ, at the beginning of our pursuit uh, 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 at, at, at root should be to understand what true worship really is because we understand who we are worshiping. And after we answer the who and, and, and the how, we move to the where. Jesus told the woman at the well, a time will come where you will not worship in the, in the synagogue, in the sanctuary. You will worship in spirit and in truth anywhere you go. But it's very necessary for the believer, hear me now, to be in the fellowship of the local church. A brother here, this will come out more later, a brother, a brother here recently told another brother here in the church, something's not right with you. Are you okay? And the brother went to the doctor based on this man's warning and just found out that he had a brain tumor. It was a brother in this church who recognized something wasn't right with the fellow brother who now is in recovery and doing well, and he's got a road ahead of him, but how do you think this would have ended how the, if the fellow brother in Christ had not warned him? Not just for moments like that, but in moments of encouragement. You guys, you're the only family I got. I, I, it, it stinks for you, I'm sorry, but you know... <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You're the only family I got. And you're the best family I got. And I'm grateful for that, man. At the same time, we notice throughout biblical history that people met in various locations, including house churches, but the house churches were because it was a necessity. This is a house church. Amen. You know? This is a small church. This is a house church. Yeah, we have small groups, Bible studies, things like that. That's not what we're getting at. We're talking about, and those are helpful to grow you, but this is where the body of believers must get to worship as we're talking about. But the, the parent crisis and the, the revolution of our worship today, you know, we think we have to do things a certain way, but guys, worship is not evangelism. Worship is worship unto God. I'm going to say that one more time. Worship is not evangelism. We don't make streamlined worship so that when people come in here, they're evangelized by the music and what we do with it. Worship is worship unto God. Evangelism should have brought them here in the first place. And if they walk in, sit down, and don't like what's being heard, sang, said, thought, and they leave and never come back, bye! No, hear me! It is the work solely of the Spirit of God to draw them in. If they're not meant to be here, they don't stay. But we cannot sissify this and sissify him in order to make them feel, what, more comfortable? Then we don't understand who God is. I want everybody who walks in here to feel the love but if that love of being greet, greeted by everybody here and a message preached by the, you know, from the gospel and, and, and music that glorifies God and, and, the, and the brother uh, elder that gives the message to lead them to communion and, and we pray together isn't enough, then we've got to send them on their way. So my words of bye are not being uh, uh, you know, obtuse. They're being practical. You can't paint a picture to appease people. If the gospel offends them, then it offends them. But I pray that it offends them in a different way. And that leads me to the final portion of Scripture this morning. Mark 2, 1 through 12. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door, and he was preaching the word to them, and they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, 
And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. He's back at his own home. Faith of the paralytic is obvious. They lead him down through the roof. He sees the faith of the man. He gets, you know, the, the guy wants to be healed. And he's going, he's paralytic. The only thing he's got is his voice. Let me down through the roof. Get me as close as you can to this man. And he does. And he's healed. The point, you guys, is that this brings us to our final point this morning. Trust the authority. Trust in his authority. You, you know, I make the appeal this morning to three groups. To the unbeliever, I appeal to give an ear to what was said this morning. But hear me on this this morning. I cannot make the unbeliever believe in anything that I have said. No, that's strictly the job of the Holy Spirit of God to reveal it to you. Faith comes by hearing and hearing from the words of Christ. It's got to be preached. And I pray that the unbeliever has that moment that the Lord uh, you know, brings you into him. When Jesus told the people gathered in the passage of John 6, 44, Nobody can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. How's he going to be drawn? By the Spirit of God. How's it going to happen? Through the words of teaching. That's what evangelism is all about. But it's my commission as a preacher of Christ's truth to teach the word to all, uh, to all of you. And I pray that it hits your heart, that it doesn't return void. I know that faith comes by hearing. That's why I preach the gospel. To the believer... The second group this morning, the follower of Christ, I pray that the, the, the truth in which the Spirit of God is revealing to you this morning permeates your hearts even more than when you walked in this morning. You have to understand the authority on whom you serve. Jesus Christ is our Savior. He is one with God the Father, one with the Spirit, and you have to understand just who He is before you really truly begin to worship. In a moment, you can reevaluate what I said, like I asked you to, and you can put it back in your heart if you're ready to go and good to go. Maybe it's, it's, in, it's enlightened, maybe it's strengthened. It doesn't make you a weak believer, it makes you a strong believer. That's why we hear the preached message of the gospel. But to the third group, that's the one I want you to hear this morning. That's the fence treader. You who consider yourself a follower of Christ, but only when it fits you. You who lives half your time in Christ, half of the time not. You're the one I'm worried about. I can't control the unbeliever for, for believing. I pray that they do. And I pray that the believer is strengthened. But if you're a fence treader, your peace, your livelihood, and more importantly, your eternal salvation is up to, for you to examine this morning. Start living like he is your savior and you believe in his authority. Start treating him like the God that he is and approach him in reverence of worship. And stop acting like he's only there as an ATM machine for you. You know? Or a gumball machine. Or what's the one in the movie Big? Zoltar. That's right. Go to the boardwalk to get your lucky wit. No, that's not who he is. He is God. 
Approach him reverently and adore him. But all three of these groups, I pray that you are moved this morning to truly understand that we serve the Savior of the world. So let me ask you this question one last time before we pray. Is Jesus your King? Is Jesus your Lord? Father God, we come before you and we thank you. We praise you. And we give you all the glory this morning. Lord God, if any one of us is sick this morning, if any one of us is hurting, then we pray, Lord God, you would forgive us of our sins. And if you would see fit to see any one of us through our health ordeal and heal us, Lord God, that it is by your authority, by your mercy, that this would happen. You are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. You are wonderful, merciful. You are the perfect physician. You are the wonderful counselor. And we give you all the glory. We ask of you, Father God, to constantly show us and reveal to us who you are. And enlighten us by driving us to seek more about you. It's in your perfect, precious, holy, and most perfect name we ask these things. And all of God's children said, Amen.